Okay, our last faculty speaker is Yancy Diaz Mercado from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. All right, thank you everybody for sticking around for this talk. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make it as intuitive as possible. I know we're saturated by the end of the day. Um, so, so this talk that uh, it's really um, a combination of different projects that uh, some of the students in my group have been performing over the last couple of years uh, on this idea of enabling uh, effective, and that's a loaded term, so I'll try to explain what we mean by that, uh, human swarm interactions. Um, and, and, and so the, the, the idea really behind our lab, the Collaborative Control, Robot, um, Collaborative, uh, Control and Robotics Lab is uh, this, this old adage that there's strength in numbers, right? And so what we try to do is exploit the fact that we may have a multi-robot system, a multi-agent system, maybe a large scale multi-robot system um, to exploit the robustness that we could get through this redundancy of agents, right? So that if uh, some of the robots fail, you still have other robots to perform the task, right? And, and the, the, the network of robots can, as it were, heal. Um, you can exploit complementary capabilities so that uh, not all robots have to have all the, the same capabilities, but instead uh, they can share some of those resources so you don't have to have very expensive robots, uh, very specialized robots. You can have kind of that multitude of, of ideas. And, and with respect to human swarm interactions, the idea that we can have some sort of hybrid intelligence when we uh, use uh, the, the, the intuitive nature of humans, that adaptability that humans have to unknown environments uh, and combine them with that low, um, uh, low level computational efficiency that robots can have, right? So they can make fast computations very, very often. Um, and, and so that hybrid intelligence is what we're seeking for a lot of different applications. Certainly um, in, in the case of autonomous driving and transportation systems, we see more and more uh, of the idea that, you know, we're not gonna be able to have to go from, you know, fully human driven systems to fully automated driven systems. We're gonna have to go somewhere in the middle uh, for some time, right? And so we need to understand how humans and robots can interact with one another. And, uh, perform safe, right, interactions. Um, the idea of last mile delivery, we saw some of the efforts from Amazon, uh, perhaps not Amazon Robotics per se, but uh, um, of, of having robots take that package, uh, that last mile right to the, to the house. And so they have to interact with humans, uh, potentially having multiple robots interacting uh, with humans or multiple humans, right, and crowds, crowd navigation. Uh, we have some projects on the idea of healthcare. Uh, robotics, so maybe not uh, mobile robots like the ones we have here. So these are really where the key uh, robotic system from Amazon, Amazon Robotics, um, uh, but maybe perhaps something like surgical tools, right? And how they would interact with one another in order to perform complex uh, surgical procedures uh, and public health, right? So right at the time we were working on this, uh, you know, we were hit, we were struck uh, with the pandemic and the idea that you know all of a sudden uh, these robots can go uh, and safely uh, monitor areas or, or sanitize where people couldn't go kind of became more and more prevalent, right? So there's a lot of opportunities for, for these robotic swarm systems uh, to be effective now, right? There's a lot of opportunities now to, to deploy them. And so what we need to do is you need to address the main challenges when we're dealing with this very, very large scale system. So right? challenges with scalability, right? So that the algorithms can um, still work as we extend the number of agents that the computations don't, don't take longer and longer. Um, tracking performance, right? If we have a human interacting with the, the swarm that the robots are gonna be able to keep up, right? That they're, um, that, that they're not gonna get delayed or any in, in, in such way that's gonna lead to some sort of a unsafe uh, environment for, for the humans and the robots, right? We don't want robots uh, to be colliding with one another necessarily. Um, how do we address the human robot, uh, human robot communication and interaction uh, as well as a robot robot communication and interaction? Do we need the infrastructure for robots to talk to all of them? Do we need to do have systems that have no communication whatsoever, right? Um, do humans have to learn the language of robots? Do, do, do uh, robots have to learn the language of humans, right? So all that stuff needs to be figured out and we need to um, find uh, intuitive ways in order to do that, right? So uh, part of the reason that we are seeking this intuitiveness as it were on, on the algorithms and the deployments that we have is um, we want to deploy these systems in the real world. And we wanna do that without having to go through a PhD in robotics in order to uh, be able to, to control these robots, right? We don't want, we want uh, people that are not necessarily experts to, um, with minimal training, be able to operate the systems. Right? And one of the ways in we, we can do that uh, potentially is by making sure that the algorithms are intuitive, right? They're, they are, um, uh, they, they are things that you can do um, if you have any sort of experience with everyday technology, like cell phones and computers. 
So throughout these talks, it's, it's basically split into two components. Uh, well, the first component I'm gonna be talking about is manipulating the swarm of robots, right? So at the very low level, if you have a large number of robots, how do you produce scalable algorithms in order to influence the swarm in some fashion? Um, and then I'll move a little bit into the human-human, uh, human-robot collaboration aspect of it. So in order to develop this intuitive control, um, when you have a very large scale system, you really can't be thinking about controlling individual robots, right? It just becomes unfeasible really quickly. Uh, so what you want to do is set an objective for the collective, right? For the, for the large scale uh, team um, and have the individual robots kind of figure it out on the fly, right? So they should be able to co coordinate with one another uh, uh, in order to um, figure out their motion and make sure that um, they don't do that in a way that requires knowledge about everything that's going on in the world, because again, you may have a very large number of robots and that becomes unfeasible, right? So you might wanna have some sort of a rule say that you only need to interact with the nearest robots, for example, in order to kind of limit uh, the, the, the amount of information exchange that's required. Um, and so I, I, have a, I have a young kid that really loves to play with the um, uh, uh, kinetic sand, so this little deformable uh, particles. And you know, as, as she's playing with this, I, I realized that uh, this is really an example of a, a swarm manipulation task, right? So we have all these granules, these little particles uh, that somehow you don't really see them for particles. You only see the blob, right? You only see the, the, the accumulation of all these points and you're you know, playing with them, you're, you're shaping their boundary, you're um, manipulating their position, their shape, their scale. Uh, but at no point you're thinking about the individual points, right? The particles in this. Right? And, and I think that's the abstraction that we need to make in order to come up with these scalable uh, algorithms. So what we wanna do is abstract the swarm as a mass. We don't wanna care about the particles, the particular robots. You just wanna care about the, the, the team as a whole. Um, and in particular, what we're gonna be doing in this talk is uh, we're gonna do that abstraction through a boundary. So we're gonna say, here's the boundary of my swarm. That's what I'm trying to control. The robots are gonna then have to figure out how do they uh, conform to that shape that I'm providing in, in an intelligent fashion. Okay? And so I'm gonna postulate here that the coverage control provides a scalable mechanism to actually influence a swarm of robots uh, by providing this boundary that's an abstraction for the swarm. Okay. And so formally, let me tell you what this idea of coverage control is. Um, in particular, coverage control of these deformable uh, boundaries, which I'm gonna call time-bearing domains. Uh, it's, it's defined as a minimization problem. And so you have this so-called locational cost. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's nothing more than an area integral uh, divide over partitions of this domain, this boundary that we're providing, uh, and then add it up for all the agents. Right? And so there's a couple of elements here. They're not, again, super important. Um, the, the idea that we have this convex time bearing domain that's gonna serve as an exogenous input. That's the thing that I get to manipulate the, the, domain, the bots where the robots live, for example, in this picture, right? Uh, we have some notion of density, right? So, you know, some points might be more important than others, right? So we can actually affect the concentration of robots. We can do that on the fly. So it's a function of time. Um, we have the position of the robot. So this is the thing that we're actually trying to design control loss for so that they can figure out where they need to go. Um, and then we have this idea of a Voronoi uh, tessellation of the space, which means the robots, um, what they do is they split the space up, this domain, they split it up into chunks and they say, this is my part of the domain. I'm in charge of covering this part of the space. Okay. And so the idea here is to figure out how do you, uh, given this partitioning scheme, decide where you need to go in order to have this optimal coverage right, that minimizes this locational cost. Okay. Um, what is the best configuration? And how do we make sure that this best configuration is actually maintained as I am changing the boundary, right? I'm providing this as solid as input as a human operator, right? We want to make sure that the robots reconfigure on the fly optimally, right? And, and are actually able to keep up with the commanded uh, uh, boundaries provided by say a human. So what do we know? We know that a necessary condition for optimality is this so-called centrodal Voronoi bor tessellation, right? And, and so all that means is that the position of the robot coincides with the center of mass of their individual cells, right? They break up the space, there's a density in this space, they can figure out what the center of mass is. And if they happen to be standing, all the robots happen to be standing in that particular spot, then this is a necessary condition for optimality. And so all we're gonna do is actually figure out a way of achieving and tracking this internal born tessellation configuration. Right? For if we do, then we have the necessity, necessary conditions for optimality. Uh, intuitively, right, you know, coming from a background of controls and, and from all the presentations that we've seen today, right, we can kind of figure out what are the, the ingredients that we need to, to make sure that we track this effectively. 
the first component I'm going to argue is, is tracking feedback. You know, you know, controls people. We love feedback, right? Uh, that's what allows us to this, uh, reject some of the disturbances and actually be able to be, to a degree, robust uh, with respect to the performance. So we somehow need some tracking feedback. But we also need to anticipate, as was uh, brought up before, right? So we need to figure out um, if, if I'm providing uh, some changes to uh, the, 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 the swarm as an input, then I should be able to somehow anticipate that change in order to maintain that optimality. So feed forward is also going to be key. And then lastly, because we have a number of agents, we need to make sure that we have proper amount of coordination between the agents. We shouldn't need to coordinate all to all, but certainly some coordination can help with the improvement of the, of the tracking performance. So here's the control law that we're going to use. Uh, in fact, uh, here's a family of control laws that we're going to be using in order to achieve this objective of adding the robots to go to the centroids of their boron cells. Okay. So the actual expression is not entirely that important. What I want you to focus on is the different components that we can map back to that uh, recipe that I just provided. So in these blue bots, we have a feedback term that actually makes you track, make the robots track that center of mass. Now that center of mass, in case it wasn't obvious before, um, is an implicit function of the position of the agents because the, the cell that you are in actually depends on the position of the agents. It depends on the position of your neighbor. So it's also an implicit function of uh, the position of your neighbor. So uh, it, might, it might seem like a linear tracking uh, term, but it's actually quite nonlinear. Right? Uh, but however, uh, we know this uh, particular algorithm uh, works, at least for static cases, works really well. It's called uh, Lloyd's algorithm, and it's, it's a known result since 1982, right? So it's been here for a while. This is a continuous version of the original proposed algorithm. And it says, go to your center of mass. That's basically what it says. It provides that feedback reje uh, disturbance rejection component. This other term right here is a feed forward term. It actually says, account for the evolution of the domain. So the user is going to say, hey, change. And I can anticipate how my center of mass is going to change as a consequence. Right? This last term, uh, this, this uh, matrix gain, uh, actually accounts for the coordination between the different agents. Right? I don't want to go into too much details for how we actually compute this, but uh, we can actually approximate that inverse with a set of distributed families so that we can control how much information we actually need to exchange from not knowing every, any, uh, nobody's uh, position except my own to knowing my neighbor's uh, position, my neighbor's neighbor's position, and so on. Right? So we get to control that. Um, and, and a theorem uh, states that if we have the control at the top, that we can actually achieve exponential uh, tracking of a central borne net oscillation. Right? So this, this control law works. Uh, but does it scale, right? And, and so for the inverse that we showed uh, in the previous slide, it does not. But so for some of the distributed families, uh, we actually have very good convergence in fact, or scalability. In fact, the control law scales with a uh, constant time with respect to the number of agents, right? Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for this. So you can see here in the simulation, we have a bunch of agents covering this domain. Uh, you notice that the, this emergent kind of configuration that you get is like a honeycomb structure, right? So you have this hexagon uh, positions. Uh, it's a fact from computational geometry that when you have this many uh, agents in a plane, you can only pack them in such a way that uh, on average, you get about six agents as neighbors. That's why we get this honeycomb structure. Uh, or, or you know, you may get uh, 12 neighbors neighbors uh, in, 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 by the same logic, right? Uh, this is again, it's, it's a fact from computational geometry. We see it often in nature, so if you look at uh, um, the, the, the wings of a firefly or if I, uh, uh, a horsefly, you'll see that they have this uh, boron oscillation, the spots on a giraffe, the, the, the shell of a, of a turtle, everything that you have kind of growth in nature uh, of multiple uh, uh, cells, you're going to get something like this. Right? But the advantage of this is that that combined with our closed form analytical expressions actually results um, in, in an algorithm that depends only in a uh, fits number of agents, even if you have a very large team of robots, about 30 seats in total, in the worst case on average. Right? So even if you have a thousand robots, you only need to know about 30 seats robots position for some of these algorithms to, to be able to compute the control law. And, and the reason for that is because it doesn't, if I'm the agent in the middle, I don't care what the agents on the boundaries are doing. They don't affect my, my position. They're too far away. Right? That's the reason for that. So, so we have very good scalability. Uh, let me just show a demonstration uh, with a very number of agents. This is a human input um, a demonstration where we have a, a human operator providing a reference motion for a box. And then there, it's the, the, the 
uh, job of the robots to kind of spread out in this bots optimally. Okay? We can do it with three, four, five, six, 100. It doesn't matter. It's an offset to the number of robots, right? They just say, what are they, who are the robots that are nearest to me? And then how do I, how do I move in order to make sure that we have this optimal configuration? Okay? Uh, it's it's self-reconfiguring. So if I take one of these robots and actually pick them up, the other robots move in order to maintain optimal coverage. Okay? So they heal, right? So if one of these robots fails, it still works. And all the human is doing then is just making sure to control the bots in an appropriate fashion to, for example, avoid the obstacles, which are the red uh, polygons here on the floor. Okay? So this gives them the mechanism to actually control uh, the robots um, to provide human input. How should that human input be provided? Um, so we've been doing a, 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 another project of ours. We've been exploring how uh, we actually achieve this so-called synergistic human uh, swarm interactions by exploring how humans uh, coordinate with other humans. For example, when they're lifting up this table. Uh, and so what we, what we believe is that if we have these intuitive interactions, like uh, you know, when we have uh, people just saying, okay, we're gonna move this table without actually having too much communication coordination. Um, if we can learn how people do this, then, then we can have uh, biomimetic behavior for robots so that uh, it feels natural, right? So to, to work with the robots, like it feels natural to work with people to, to, to perform this, these tasks. Um, and, and so in neuromotor control, uh, these physical type of interactions are actually explained through a theory called interpersonal motor synergies. So it's, it's, a, it's a series of neuromotor control uh, signals that the, the, the central nervous system produces in order to control. Uh, they can be decomposed using this, this, this theory into two components, the task level, which is a sure objective. You're trying to do something collectively. Uh, and this interagent level, which is nothing more than error compensation, right? So if, if I get tired and I drop the, the table a little bit, the people can pick up the stuff, right? And so what we did is we, we took uh, some of the well-known consensus algorithms in the, in the network control literature and model the effects that uh, this task level, interagent level um, are, are serves in the neuromotor um, uh, uh, theory in order to make a connection, right? So we established a connection between control theory and this uh, neuroscience uh, field. Um, and so what we were able to do then is um, through a series of human-human collaboration experiments, uh, get a very simple model that uses consensus algorithms with a few tuning knobs that we don't actually need to tune in any particular way. We can pick from uh, distributions of, of known, well-known uh, human factors. Co uh, co and, and then combine them with this topological uh, interaction between agents and some kind of a broadcast you know, task level objective, like move the bots around in order to reproduce the same behavior that we saw from the experiment. And so here's a sample trajectory, but the idea here is that we're able to statistically reproduce the same type of interactions that we saw between the humans through these models with no, no particular tuning, just by randomly drawing from these distributions. Okay? And so this is a mechanism to actually um, uh, reproduce this biomimetic behavior. Right? And so we can apply it to our human swarm interactions and, and get intuitive control. So uh, to conclude, uh, we have other efforts. I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to some of my students uh, here for understanding uh, human swarm interactions. So here we have uh, a study where we're doing remote accessible um, human swarm interactions. So people actually zoom in and control our robots uh, from, from, from afar. Um, and we're testing the idea of uh, having this augmented reality and visual reality components in order to make the controller more, the control more intuitive, right? So again, we want people that are not trained experts to be able to use the systems and achieve uh, the different objectives, as well as, um, you know, manipulation tasks. So how do we actually use the robots to do something? Um, so we're coming up with this low complexity manipulators to perform high complexity tasks, but again, exploiting the fact that we have a lot of robots, so strength in numbers. Uh, uh, so conclusion, we are able to produce these scalable algorithms uh, to do fast tracking. Um, and, and we're hoping to incorporate some of this intuitive uh, biomimetic behavior in order to achieve uh, this effective human storm interaction. I want to give a shout out to my students, uh, many of which are here. Thank you so much for, for your effort, as well as some of my, some of my collaborators and, and some of my uh, funding sources for this uh, work. Um, thank you. Any questions? What if you have obstacles? Yeah, so, um, so for the, the, this coverage control based approach, we have studied um, 
we have studied what happens if the you have non convex formations in your domain so you actually have to put holes because there's you know there's a wall or you're going through something or somebody happens to decide that they want to walk through your domain um, and we have some capabilities to handle that yeah thank you and we thank the speaker